I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 13. We'll begin our time this morning in God's Word by reading this passage. Romans 13, beginning in verse 1, God writes through the Apostle Paul, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is our heart's desire as those who love you, as those who knew what it was like to be slaves of sin and and now have now been adopted into your family and have been made slaves of Christ and slaves of righteousness. We are under the reign of grace leading to eternal life. Lord, we as your people want to be under your word. You are the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And there is a day coming where every earthly authority will bow the knee to you. In the meantime, these are your servants for our good. We trust you. We pray that you would help us by your word, even this morning, to fortify our hearts to do that which would please you, to do that which would make the gospel look good, to do that which would maintain the reputation of your church on the earth. And we ask all this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The world is getting restless, wondering if the coronavirus pandemic will subside, wondering perhaps if the government restrictions will ease up anytime soon. How are you doing? How are you doing this morning? You need to remember that the coronavirus is not persecution. The church is not being singled out for mistreatment. In fact, at the federal level and in the state of Arizona, the government is bending over backwards to protect religious freedoms. For this, we can give much thanks. But in the kindness of God, the coronavirus is giving Christians in our day, in our country, an opportunity to test drive our heart's response to government authorities. Government authorities not behaving in the way we might like or prefer, in a way that is at least an inconvenience and perhaps even a threat to the way of life we've been accustomed to. So how is your heart responding to the actions of governing authorities? Is our thinking worldly or is our thinking biblical? Do you remember what Paul said in Romans 12 too? We are not to be squeezed into the mold of this world, but we are in fact to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You and I are to be saturated by God's word and God's way of thinking. We are to have biblical and eternal priorities rather than to just go along with what comes easy in our culture and in our world. This takes for us a little bit of recalibration. And in the providence of God, we just happen to be in Romans 13 during this time. I think we need to get to the point where we see, as one writer said, that government is more than a nuisance to be put up with. It is, in fact, established by God to accomplish some of his purposes on the earth. Are you ready to see government that way? And to respond the way the Apostle Paul has enjoined us in some of the passages we looked at last week, to see human government as a gift from God, therefore to respond with gratitude, eager submission, and prayer. These things ought to be the heartbeats of a Christian response to governmental authority. This is a test for our own hearts this morning. Are you thankful for government as an institution ordained by God? Are you eager to be subject to governing authorities for conscience sake and for the glory of God and for the witness of the gospel and the reputation of the church? Do you find your heart filled with the resonance of heaven's speech 
Do you pray? Are you praying for governors and for kings and for all who are in authority, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension? How is your heart responding this week, even this morning, to the actions of governing authorities in our state, in our nation, and around the world? The bottom line for this passage, the main idea of this section is simply this. Christians must submit to government. Christians must submit to the governing authorities. That's very clear in verse 1. Paul says every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And this is the heading for all that is in verses 1 to 4. It's repeated again in verse 5 and becomes the heading for verses 5 through 7. And it's important for us to hear this command. Maybe for a few moments this morning to put ourselves in the shoes of Roman believers in the first century. How would Paul's first hearers have heard this text? How would they have read this letter from the Apostle Paul? Whether Jew or Gentile, there there would have been challenges to the heart in reading instructions like this. It's going to be helpful for us to put ourselves in the imaginary shoes of an emperor or a governor in the first century in the Roman Empire. How would they have heard these instructions? Maybe in the, in the shoes of a Roman soldier, what would it be like to hear these words from a Christian in the first century? It's going to be important for us to think about these words in light of being a believer in the United States of America in the 21st century. To, to think through the lens of being a student, a son or a daughter, a driver, a taxpayer, an employee, an athlete, a homeowner, a hunter. It'll be important for us to think through this passage from the lens of being a teacher or a parent, a police officer, a coach, an employer, a city council member, or a president. You see, all of us are under authority. And many of us are simultaneously under authority and in positions of authority. And what is Paul's What is God's instruction for us in this text? Every person. Every person. That is, it is a common duty to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There are no exemptions. There are no special privileges. Nobody gets to opt out. And we really are to be in subjection. That is, in verse 1, to recognize our subordinate place. And I think this is really the hardship for us. We don't like to think of ourselves in a subordinate relationship to some other person who is in charge of us, especially when that person is flawed. And the rebuttals, the excuses, the caveats that we like to give as a response to this command are the same ones that we give to other commands for submission in the scriptures. And this reveals something about us, something that's not right about us. We do not like to be told what to do. And if we can find some wiggle room, some exception, then we'll make every attempt to exempt ourselves from the command to be subject to authority. And especially if I can couch my rebellion in theological language. Boy, my flesh loves the theological camouflage that that rebellion provides Whether it is the subjection of wives to husbands or children to parents, employees to employers, Christians to one another, or simply the resistance in our hearts to submit to God's word when it confronts something that we hold more precious than obedience. We just bristle at the idea of submission. I'm not going to submit to my parents when they are behaving so unreasonably. You know, I I can't submit to my husband when he doesn't listen to me. Or, I won't submit to Christ and love my wife sacrificially if she's not going to meet me halfway. I don't want to submit to the preferences of others in the church because, frankly, my preferences are better. Or, my boss doesn't deserve my respect, so I'm not going to give him my respect. But you know, Christian, that our obedience to God is never conditioned on our circumstances. We do not get to write history or ordain institutions or wait around until they're favorable for us in order to obey God. Ours is to trust God and to obey him. And notice what Paul says here in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Notice the plural there. 
the governing authorities here indicates all levels, all levels of, of a bureaucratic regime, all levels and stratifications of the government that's over us. You and I do not get to pick and choose. This instruction is from God. And our loyalty as Christians is to Christ. You remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. He says, all authority is given to me. Who is the rightful possessor of all authority? It's God himself and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, our Lord's instructions, our King's instructions, are to submit to earthly, flawed authorities. This from the one who in Revelation 19, 16 is called the King of Kings. To follow his instructions here is really to put ourselves under him, under Christ, and he is good. And so we need to recalibrate our thinking. And to do so, Paul gives us some help, some really timely help. He gives us some vital theological truths that we need to undergird this command for submission. And we're going to see these in the first four verses of Romans 13. Again, the bottom line is Christians must submit to governing authorities. And Paul gives us the theology that undergirds Christians' submission. We see the first element, the first theological truth there in verse 1. And it is simply this, governing authorities are from God. Governing authorities are from God. And we began to look at this last week. Look at verse 1. There is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Listen, that is a statement of absolute totality. Every government that has ever existed has only existed under the sovereign plan of the king of all kings. This has always been the case. God said this about Pharaoh in Exodus 9. He said to Pharaoh, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Whether or not Pharaoh realized it, Pharaoh assumed he'd gotten his power on his own accord or by heredity, but God was behind it. In 2 Samuel 12, God says the same thing to David in a rebuke from the prophet Nathan. He says, I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. It wasn't because David was the best kid in his family. It wasn't because David could kill bears uh, with rocks and slings. It wasn't because David had killed Goliath. All of it was because God gave him the throne. In 1 Kings 12, 15, we read of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who was a wicked king. And it's recorded that he did not listen to the people. Why? Because it was a turn of events from the Lord that the Lord might establish his word. Listen, God was in charge of a wicked king oppressing the people because God was going to accomplish his purposes that he promised. Proverbs 21.1 says it clearly, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. The Lord turns that heart of the king wherever he wishes. Isaiah 41 tells us that God is the one that delivers up nations before him. He subdues kings. He makes them like dust with his sword as the wind-driven chaff with his bow. In Isaiah 44, he says of Cyrus... Cyrus, a, a wicked pagan king, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire, says the Lord. In Isaiah 45, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by my right hand. I have called you by your name, Cyrus. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. I will gird you, though you have not known me that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun, there is no one besides me. I am Yahweh and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am Yahweh who does all these things. In Jeremiah 25, we read of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and God calls Nebuchadnezzar, a wicked pagan king, my servant. And what is God going to do with Nebuchadnezzar? He's going to bring his promised judgment against his people Israel. God will employ a wicked king to do evil, wicked things against his people to accomplish God's good purpose of judgment and ultimately refinement for the people. 
In Jeremiah 27, God says, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power and my outstretched arm, and I will give it to the one whom I please. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. Listen, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the world empire in his day. Nobody tells Nebuchadnezzar what to do. But what do we see behind the scenes? God is orchestrating history. He is in charge over Nebuchadnezzar. God is sovereign. And here's what Daniel says about that in Daniel 2.21. It is God who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings. He establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. He talks about what would happen to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. You will be driven away from mankind. Your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar had claimed, look at all this stuff I built with my own hands. And God said, Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't do this. I'm going to make you go crazy and drool and eat grass. And then I'm going to bring you to your senses. And in the end, Nebuchadnezzar said exactly what God said he would say. That Yahweh is king over all kings. He is in charge of all things. And Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king who thought he was in charge of the world, surrendered and bowed the knee to God. Jesus said this very thing in John 19, 11 to Pilate. He said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. In Revelation 13, this is really striking. Six times in Revelation 13, power and authority are said to be given to the beast and the false prophet. That is the Antichrist and his right-hand guy. Power is given to them. Authority is given to them as they reign over a one-world one government during the Great Tribulation. And all of this is for God's purposes. Even Satan's driving that government behind the Antichrist is all under the sovereign hand of God who is the king of all kings. Now, God puts kings in power. And you have to know that with great power comes great responsibility. You knew I was going to say that. And, and you thought it was just a cheesy line from a, a superhero movie. But actually, it's a biblical principle. And I want you to hear Psalm 2. What does God say to the kings to whom he has given great power? There's accountability coming. He says, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. And he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And speaking of the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of kings, God says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And then God addresses the kings and says, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath will soon be kindled. And how blessed are those who take refuge in him. Behind every flawed human government is the flawless government of God. He ordains all things after his own counsel. And those who are safe in him are truly and ultimately safe from every form of human government that will ever exist. The Apostle Paul knew this, and he knew what it was to live in subjection to flawed human government. Paul wrote this letter under the Roman emperor that probably was responsible for putting him to death. And while Emperor Nero's early reign was marked by relative peace, 
The latter half of his rulership was marked by cruel narcissistic tyranny. It was said that Nero watched while his own city burnt to the ground. Nero's own contemporaries suspected that Nero himself burned Rome down so that he could rebuild the city after his own image and his own imagination. And to cover his own tracks, he blamed the fire on an easy target. The easy target was Christians. They had been seen as a sect of the Jews, but rejected by the Jews and despised by the Romans. They were easy prey, easy victims for the government to say, it's the Christians' fault. Nero went on to persecute Christians severely, even burning them alive as torches in his garden parties for sport. It is likely that Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome under this persecution. And Paul's letter to the Christians was written around 55 to 56 A.D., and prior to this letter, Christians in Rome had already had to bear up under difficult government. In 41 AD, Claudius limited and then put a stop to all Jewish religious gatherings. Sound familiar? This was not a COVID-19 lockdown. This was targeted religious persecution against Jews. In fact, in 49 AD, Claudius deported most Jews and Jewish sympathizers completely out of the city. They had to leave. This is one of the things that brought a little bit of tension to the church at Rome as Jews were banished from the city and then later were able to come back and, and try to filter back into a church which at that point had become mostly Gentile. And the Jews had a long history of tension with the Romans whose empire prevented the Jews from exercising their own national sovereignty. And so uprisings were common. There were revolts. There were bands of zealot assassins, and they all manifested this underlying current of resentment that eventually boiled over into large-scale revolution. And that revolution was put down by the Romans in AD 70, culminating in the destruction of the temple and the scattering of the Jews. A scattering and a destruction they really still have not recovered from. In the 50s AD, the government of Rome levied exorbitant and burdensome taxes on the people. The Jews bore this particularly heavily, since few of them were exempt from the taxes that Roman citizens were free from, besides the taxes that Jews had to pay to the religious establishment in Jerusalem. The Jews there were burdened excessively by taxation. And remember that in the first generation... Christians were considered a sect of Judaism. You can see that in the conversation with Gallio in Acts 18. He, he thinks that a dispute between Christians and Jews is just a dispute over Jewish law. They bore all the reproach of the empire for being Jews, but the Christians were also rejected by Jews for following Jesus. So really, in a sense, they were orphaned. <laughs> and when Paul wrote this letter, virtually all government officials at every level were unbelievers. There was no hope of a Christian president or Christian legislators at this point. The edicts of Claudius to stop religious meetings and then the de deportation of the Jews and then the heavy tax burdens would all be in the minds of Christians living in Rome when they received this letter and this chapter, Romans 13. This letter, in fact, came only six years after that deportation perhaps came right in the middle of that exorbitant taxation. And Paul personally knew what it was like to be mistreated by the authorities. 2 Corinthians 11 describes imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once I was stoned, in 2 Corinthians 11, he goes on to describe in Damascus, the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. In Acts 16, we read that a crowd rose up together against Paul and Silas. The chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. When Paul was before Felix in Acts 24, he said to Felix, In view of this, I do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. 
Do you hear that? Despite all of the mistreatment by government, he still has a desire, even the way he's expressing this, to honor human governments and to keep a blameless conscience before them. At the same time, too, Felix was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. Paul might have been hoping for gospel conversations or a release, and Felix wanted a bribe. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. That's horrible mistreatment. And in all of that context, here is what Paul says. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Think about that. Felix, Portius Festus, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, all of them. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what's good, and you will have praise from the same. It's a minister of God to you for good. If you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. These are Paul's words. Paul the Apostle, who experienced all the mistreatment we just detailed. And he says, there is no authority except from God. No tyrant ever stole power until God gave it to him, wrote Robert Haldane. And he says, Paul says, those which exist are established by God. That is, no authority ever arose by its own power. Every one of those authorities is temporary. Every one of those authorities will be outlived by Christians, outlived by the church, outlived by the kingdom of God and the rulership of Jesus Christ. But they are established by God. Now, God has not sent the wickedness. God did not create the the wickedness of wicked rulers, that doesn't come from him. That God is ultimately sovereign over all things, and his ordination of the institution is his work. They are established by God, deposed by God, given authority by God, and as we'll see next week, they are held accountable by God. The first theological truth that undergirds our submission is that every governing authority is from God. The second is found in verse 2, and it is a corollary to that. Resistance to governing authority is opposition to God. Resistance to governing authority is opposition to God. This truth follows from the first one. Notice the therefore in verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. If the government is ultimately from God, and I'm resisting the government then I'm resisting God himself. And this is true not just for our relationship to government, but this is a biblical principle for all circumstance. If I'm angry at the timing of the traffic light, ultimately that is a frustration with the one who is sovereign over all traffic lights. That is why it is really critical that, that we follow the command that, there, that we do all things without grumbling or complaining. Do you understand that grumbling against your circumstance or complaining about your circumstances, whatever the immediate cause, have as their ultimate cause God himself? To complain and grumble about what we think are horizontal or temporal or earthly things is truly to complain and grumble against God. It is a verbal demonstration of a lack of faith, a lack of trust in his plan and his purposes and his goodness. And so Paul says, whoever resists authority, resisting authority here is a refusal to acknowledge government's authority over my life. It is to say, government does not have a legitimate claim on my behavior. Another way to say that is, don't tread on me. The truth is, we never get to be our own authority. Before you knew Christ, you were a slave of sin. You were a slave to your own appetites. You were a slave to your own destruction. You were actually under the governance of the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, Satan himself. And you were part of the anti-god world system opposed to his rulership. 
You've always been owned. And now in Christ, you are free from all of that. And you have been placed under a reign of love, a reign of grace. You are now slaves of Christ. There's no other category. Slave of sin, slave of Christ. Under the dominion of sin leading to death or under the dominion of grace leading to life. Under Satan's rule or a child of God. There's no other category. And by the way, if it could be that you could somehow be your own authority, my friend, that would not go well. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. Look, you just don't have the resources that it takes to be your own authority and for that to be successful. And the one who resists authority, Paul says here, has opposed the ordinance of God, verse 2. That is, you've opposed what God has ordained. It is God's determination to govern the world of sinful men by sinful human government. And opposing earthly authority is a serious matter. It's a serious matter. Opposition to authority is rebellion against the Lord. Do you remember the definition of sin that the Apostle John gives? Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness. Lawlessness cannot be the reputation of a Christian. R.C. Sproul tells the story of a, a friend, an English pastor visiting the United States, and he was visiting Philadelphia, and some friends had taken him to see some of the attractions in Philadelphia and, and talked him through uh, U.S. revolutionary history. It took him to Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. It was said that they visited an antique store that specialized in Americana, and among the items in the shop were placards and signs that displayed some of the battle cries and slogans of the revolutionary era, such as, no taxation without representation, and don't tread on me. But the placard that drew his keenest attention was one that announced with bold letters, we serve no sovereign here. And the pastor told R.C. Sproul later, that sign stopped me in my tracks. On seeing this sign, I was immediately filled with fear and consternation. I thought, how can I possibly preach the kingdom of God to people with such a profound aversion to sovereignty? He's right. You cannot put yourself above the law simply because you've made a determination that the speed limit on a certain stretch of road is ridiculously low. Or because you believe you shouldn't have to get a permit to build an addition onto your own house. Or because you think it's wrong to have to get a license to catch fish. Listen, anytime your self-interest is involved, anytime some government intrusion steps on the toes of your own convenience, your own way of life, your own standard of living, you ought to be suspicious of your own heart motives. You ought to be suspicious of your own heart condition when self-interest is involved. Look, if the flight attendant tells you to sit down, sit down. If your teacher tells you to stop talking in class, Christian student, out of submission to God, out of love for Christ, stop talking. Is it ever okay to appeal the demands of authority? Well, Let's answer that question by starting from a heart of submission to authority and a heart of eagerness to trust the Lord. Look, if you have a heart of submission to authority and you are eager to trust the Lord, then the way you make appeal in a classroom, the way you make appeal to a magistrate, the way you write a letter to a congressman or call up the governor, the way you fill up the phone lines in the legislative bodies of our country, will be totally different. I believe you can appeal. We're going to look at a couple biblical examples of appeal. You can call your representative. You can get legal counsel. But your heart has to be right. And I would say, by the way, your, your attitude in that moment ought to be backed up by a track record of good citizenship. If you have a reputation for being a rebel rouser and complaining and grumbling against everything the government ever does. You don't have a great platform to call up your representative and plead on behalf of others for liberties. And I would suggest that we ought to prioritize 
really consider prioritizing the nature of our appeals to government authorities. If you're the student in class that the teacher asks to be quiet and you say, yes, thank you teacher so much. Um, I respect your authority because I love Christ. Um, can I have permission to, to say something really important? And the teacher says, yes, please say it. What a great attitude. Uh, I dropped my pencil. And, and if you say that the next moment and the next moment and the next moment, the teacher's going to recognize pretty quickly that you're using a lot of good words, but you truly are not in submission to the authority in the classroom. Likewise, if you and I are known for being rebel rousers all the time, what happens when we make our appeal when it really matters, when lives are on the line, when, when other people's well-being is at stake? Will our appeal be heard? What are we known for? Will we become lawbreakers when it counts? When it's biblical truth, when it's the gospel, when it's uh, the protection of others in, in some way that, that God's word demands of us. Look, if you're out simply to protect your own comfort, your own temporal happiness, you're going to spend all of your cachet in a rebellious heart attitude for things that will not last. So it is, is it okay to appeal the demands of an authority over us? If we begin from a heart of submission and a trust with the Lord, if our hearts are filled with an eternal perspective and a biblical worldview, I think there is a place for that. I think Esther is a good example. Esther 3.13 Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, month, which is the month of Adar, and to seize their possessions as plunder. Esther. Esther 4.11 and 12 says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned... The king has only one law, that that person be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. I've not been summoned, said Esther. I haven't been summoned to the king for these 30 days. What is she going to do? Esther is going to go make appeal before the king and it could cost her her life and not bring about any beneficial result. Esther 4.14, if you remain silent, said her uncle at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And Esther responded in verse 16 of chapter 4, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will also fast in the same way. And thus I will go in to the king, which is not according to the law. And she said, and if I perish, I perish. This is significant, costly disobedience. Daniel 1 gives us another example. Daniel 1.8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which the king drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Do you notice Daniel's presentation at the very beginning? Commander, can we talk? Can I get permission to try out vegetables for a while? <laughs> it's actually against the, the law of my service to my God to eat the things at the king's table. Can, can I try something different? And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who's appointed your food and your drink. Why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer from the commander of the officials appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables and water. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants according to what you see. You see, Daniel was humble, submissive, asked permission, made an appeal, and in the end, deal with us as you please. He was willing to take his lumps. He was willing to take the consequences, recognizing that the government, the appointed government over him, 
had authority to do what they wished. Better than a show of discontentment or resistance to governing authorities, you and I ought to demonstrate an eager submission as Christ's slaves. And when is civil disobedience okay? When the government commands Christians to do something God forbids, or forbids Christians doing something God expressly commands. And we have examples of this. Exodus 1, 15 to 20. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and to see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall put him to death. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. Do you see this murderous attempt to slaughter the Jews en masse? The midwives, however, feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them. But they let the boys live. We find out that God was pleased. Verse 20, God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied, and they became very mighty. 1 Kings 18 tells us the story of Obadiah who feared Yahweh and when Jezebel the queen set out to destroy all the prophets of Yahweh, Obadiah took a hundred of those prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them bread and water. Defied the actions of the queen in order to do what pleased the Lord. In Acts 4.19, you know this, the, the first generation of Christians, the apostles, the leaders were commanded by Christ to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. In Acts 1.8, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, clear express command from scripture. And then the local governing authority said, stop preaching the gospel. But Peter and John, Acts 4.19, answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. In other words, how you respond to what we're doing, you're accountable before the Lord with that. We must obey God. In Acts 5, 29, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And the heartbeat in all of this is a respect for God's ordained authorities over us and a willingness to take the consequences from that authority when we must disobey. That leads to a third truth that you and I need to see to strengthen our commitment to submit to God's ordained authorities. First, we learned that all authorities come from God. Secondly, opposition to authorities is opposition to God. And thirdly, we discover here in verse 2 and 3 that opposition to governing authority brings trouble. If you oppose authority, and let's assume you oppose authority because you want to obey God, it will bring trouble. And if you oppose authority when you're not being pleasing to the Lord, it brings trouble. Look what Paul says here. They who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Now this here is a very practical consideration. God has ordained human governance... If you oppose these authorities, there will be trouble for you. They who have opposed, he says, will receive condemnation upon themselves. Condemnation here is simply the word for judgment. And the judgment that Paul has in view here, of course, ultimately is the judgment of God, but I believe he has in view that judgment that is mediated particularly through the state. He has ordained human governments for this very purpose. And the judgment that Christians receive who defy the governing authorities, that judgment of God through the state will come. If you oppose the government, you should expect the consequences. And if you as a Christian are going to make yourself out to be a lawbreaker, taking the consequences for criminal behavior, it better be an Acts 529 issue where obedience to God trumps obedience to men, where obedience to God truly is at stake. And if you take the consequences for violating God's laws and man's laws, you bring shame on the gospel, and you bring disrepute to the church. Now look at verse 3. Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, 
but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what's good, and you will have praise from the same. These are general statements of the purpose of human government, the primary purposes of human government, to punish bad guys and to reward good behavior for the sake of civil peace. And if you're a good doer, you have nothing to fear, says Paul. If you're a bad guy, you have cause to fear the authorities. Now, Paul is here describing a function of government and a reality of government that is generally true. And right now, no doubt, you're thinking of exceptions to that, where people who are doing good or people who are minding their own business actually are given cause to fear the government because the government is persecuting good doers. But the truth is, the exceptions prove the truth of the general statement. They actually demonstrate the truth that, generally speaking, if you're minding your own business, you don't have to be afraid. Look, it is in the state's interest to prevent theft and riot and murder running rampant. Instability, chaos, and disruption, they're not good for governments in the long run. And if only out of self-interest, this function of government is a benefit for us. The fact that governments generally punish evildoers and don't punish or even reward those who do good, praise those who do good, that's a benefit to all of humanity and it is a benefit to Christians. Human governments naturally make determinations about what they consider to be acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior. What Paul describes here as good and evil are not ultimate categories of good and evil by God's standards. These are the good and evil in the eyes of governments. What they deem to be acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior. And if you stay within the boundaries of what is deemed by the authorities to be right and good, generally speaking, you have nothing to fear. If, on the other hand, you make a name for yourself as being a rabble-rouser, the epicenter of every complaint, the instigator of riots and angry protests, an inflammatory personality, you will garner unwanted attention from the authorities. What's going to happen one day when a government decides to persecute Christians and goes back and looks through all of that stuff that's on the internet, all those things that we wrote, all of those comments and all of the threads and all those social media posts? What will they find? Will they find a good reputation, a a reputation for good works, one who is doing all things without grumbling and complaining? Will there be enough evidence against you of being a citizen of heaven, that your thoughts are elsewhere, that your loyalties are to Christ, and as far as it's possible for one who is loyal to Christ to be loyal to earthly governing authorities? Have you done this? Is that your reputation? Is that your reputation before a watching world? Now, what do we do when we find ourselves under a government that prosecutes crime inconsistently? Or even with favoritism. Maybe the well-placed or the advantageous, maybe a certain ethnicity gets beneficial treatment from governing authorities over against another. What do we do when we find ourselves under a government that calls evil good and good evil? Well, my friends, has there ever been a government that prosecuted bad behavior consistently? Has there ever been one in history that got the categories of good and evil correct? No, not one. Not yet. Verse 3, you must understand, is not the condition of our obedience. And many have preached Romans 13 that way. They said, you must be in subjection to all authorities in government. And here's what governments are supposed to do. They're supposed to get it right every time, and they're supposed to reward good behavior and punish evildoers. Submit to those kinds. But if the government's not doing that, they violated their end of the contract, and you don't have to submit. That is not the point of this passage. There's never been a government that's held up that end of the bargain. Verse 3 is not the condition for our obedience, that I will only obey the government when it accurately rewards good behavior and consistently punishes evil behavior. No, the condition of our submission has already been given to us in verse 1. Did God establish it? Yes. Then submit to it, Christian. That's the condition of our obedience. Verse 3 is an explanation of the general benefits 
of human government. And we're going to see this more fully next week in verse 4. Over the past few months, Fulani Muslim militants have been murdering Nigerian Christians at will. Every day there's a new headline detailing the slaughter of innocents and the burning of churches and the burning of homes by renegades bent on destruction and death. The human government is failing its fundamental purpose in Nigeria. Look, it's a good thing that governments punish and reward what they consider to be evil and good behavior, respectively. And flawed governments will get those categories mixed up. The guilty often go free, even rewarded, and the innocent often are harassed and punished, even killed. Paul himself would face this under Nero. Stephen faced this under the religious leaders in Jerusalem, including Paul. And Jesus suffered this under Pilate. The Apostle Paul knew all about this, and yet he has no qualm setting down God's expectation for us here in this text. Christians of all people ought to be thankful for the institution of human government. Look, the same Roman Empire that persecuted and mistreated Paul also provided protections for him and for Christians in general. You see, the Romans wanted a peaceful empire. Peace through brute force, yes, but for self-interest, they wanted tranquility. If the Roman government did not enforce this version of self-interested, oppressive tranquility, it's likely, from a human perspective, that Christians would have been completely exterminated. Did Paul's government persecute Christians? At times, yes, but it also protected Christians when they would otherwise have been vulnerable to their other persecutors. Look, there have been a lot of times in church history where if there had been no societal and governmental restraint, the enemies of Christianity would have wiped us out. Oppressive government is not the Christian's greatest threat. It is not the greatest threat to the gospel. Oppressive government has never been the greatest threat to the church. John Piper said this in 2005, Pride is a greater danger to Christians than government injustice. Being persecuted unjustly is not the reason that anybody goes to hell. But being unbelieving and arrogant and self-indulgent is why most people go to hell. End quote. Robert Haldane said, let Christians then in every country, instead of joining with the enemies of its established order, be thankful for the divine ordinance of civil government and exert themselves to maintain obedience and peace. So Christian, what if your obedience to God in Romans 13 results in a loss of temporal freedoms? Will you sing in jail? Will you, as was said of Christians in Hebrews 10, endure great conflict of sufferings, being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, becoming sharers with those who were so treated? Will you show sympathy to the prisoners and accept joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one? That's a Christian testimony. Christian, where is your safety? Your safety is in submission in every category of authority that you are under. Your safety is in the Lord and in obedience to him. If you choose to throw off the safety that God promises and exchange it, entrust your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of happiness to your own resources, you will be outgunned. You will be outgunned by the state and by the one who has established the state. Next week, we get to see, beginning in verse 4, the role of government as God's servant. As Paul describes him, as God's deacon for your own good, Christian. And that's going to be a timely help for us. Let's pray. God, we just put our lives before you. We want to lay low before you, our sovereign, our king, our father, our Savior, our provider, our protector. God, it is our eternal inheritance that we look forward to. We know that moth and rust, thieves, 
will do away with the temporal things of this life. One day you will burn it all up, and in the meantime, maybe a government would take some of it away. But our treasure is with you. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We are citizens of heaven, and we wait eagerly for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. He will transform our bodies by the power he has to subdue everything under his throne, under his authority, to make every knee bow, even his enemies confess that he is Lord, and how we long for that day, O Lord, for your vindication. In the meantime, let us be seen and known as your loyal subjects. And if you would call us to be subject to earthly kings, petty subregions who do only your bidding, O God, let us do that gladly. And let us proclaim the gospel the whole way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.